Welcome back, my awesome people. In today's episode, I'll be talking with comedic sensation Kevin, aka Kevin Bread and Water, about business, the comedy world, being an entrepreneur, and as a native Californian who is from Los Angeles, what he thinks about California's policies and the upcoming United States election and whether or not Trump's presidency will be good for America if elected. And what that would mean for him as a Latino. Kevin is a Latino comic born and raised in Los Angeles. Kevin started doing stand-up as a joke, but eventually started taking the jokes seriously. He is known for his nonchalant dry humor, and Kevin prefers to tell a story rather than just punch liners and one-liners. Kevin has performed all over Los Angeles and the United States. He has performed at places like the Hollywood Comedy Store, the Ice House, the Ha Ha Cafe, Flappers, and the Laugh Factory. Kevin has also won the Aces Comedy Competition and the Ha Ha Cafe's next comic standing. So get into this episode with me. All right, my awesome people. So I am here with Kevin, also known as Kevin Bread and Water. So yes. Kevin, uh, yes. tell us more about yourself. Uh, who are you, your background, living in California? What's going on? Uh, my name is actually Kevin Paniagua, which in, in, in Spanish means bread and water. So Pretty much I just translated it on Instagram. But I am from uh, Los Angeles, California. Uh, my parents uh, immigrated to this country. They're from El Salvador. I'm um, first generation. Uh, lived in Los Angeles, California my whole entire life. So I've seen, you know, I don't want to say the decline, but I've seen the decline, you know, firsthand, you know, in neighborhoods that we, uh, that I grew up in, you know, they look worse now. But uh, I am a stand-up comedian. I've been doing comedy for about 10 years, you know, hitting the stages, hitting the open mics. And um, because, because it seems like comedy has transitioned into the social media uh, aspect. So I kind of pivoted to social media, which is where I kind of developed like a small following, uh, mainly by criticizing the Democratic Party, which is, uh, I think, my forte. And... Um, yeah, it's it's been fun. It's been a fun ride. And you know what? As you're going through this journey, seeing, you know, your state, your neighborhoods not doing as good as they used to be, is this what kind of maybe inspired you to be a comedian, kind of using comedy to not, you know, criticize or talk about, but kind of show important features and important things that's going on in a comedic way? When I started comedy, no, that was not... Uh... Uh, I started comedy mainly, I think, because of I was in a rough. Um, I was, you know, it was a rock bottom a, a moment for me or time. And I saw uh, I went to a stand up show and my ego was like, oh, my God, you do that all the time. So why not do it on stage? And that idea kind of stuck with me. And at the moment, I didn't have anything to lose. So I did it and it was great. It was fun. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot. It gave me a lot of confidence. And at the time, um, I was struggling with who I was. So that uh, gave me an identity. And, you know, as I started evolving as a comedian, um, I just, I kind of made the, the move to political humor because that was what, you know, what I felt at the time. Um, but it didn't start off as like, oh, I'm going to make fun of, you know, politics or whatever. It kind of it kind of evolved into that, you know, and that's where I am right uh, at the moment. No, I totally understand. Uh, sometimes uh, the evolution of, you know, comedy, your life uh, can take a different turn depending on what you've learned about yourself, how you've evolved as a person as well. Um, yeah. But I'm glad that you came out at that bottom and look at you now. You're doing amazing. You're going oh, yeah, to yeah. Laugh Factory. Um, you're meeting celebrities, celebrity comedians. Yeah. Talking about that first performance or first time you did stand up. Can you tell us about, about that experience? Uh, yeah, um, it was actually a friend of mine at the time who uh, signed me up for an open mic because I just wouldn't shut up about it. I was like, you know, I want to do I want to do it. I want to do it. But I never really jumped into it because it's kind of a scary experience um, to be in front of people and like making them laugh. That's, you know, that's a little scary. So it my is. friend signed me up, you know, and he's like, all right, now you have to do it because I signed you up. And if not, you know, 
you're going to back out, you know, like I didn't want to back out. I didn't want to be that guy. So I ended up doing it. And, you know, it was an open mic at the Ha Ha in um, North Hollywood. It's a comedy, it's a comedy club in North Hollywood. Um, and yeah, it was a, it was an eye-opening experience. And I was like, man, I, it was like a roller coaster. Like, I want to do this again. I want to write that again. And, you know, I kept doing it and I kept finding success and, you know, people liked it making people laugh became like my focus. You know? Do you, do you remember any, maybe one joke from your first appearance? I did this, uh, I did this, you know, it's looking Years back ago. on it, it's all cringe. Like I cringe. I can't look at myself <laughs> at the time, you know? Um, but it was this bit about like, uh, it was, I called it the avatar bit, like bit, uh, yeah. the mo based on the movie avatar where I like went to a home Depot and like, <laughs> bought some blue paint and like covered myself in it and got high from the fumes and like it was it's pretty cringe looking back on it but it made people laugh at the time and you know i think a lot of things that we did back in the days when we look back on it is totally cringe right now i know at oh, least yeah. a million and one things that i've done <laughs> in the past where i look back sure. and i'm like okay i should not have done that um yeah. so when you're when you're writing your i know now you're kind of more in the political part but your material does it just come from day-to-day -day things that you see um how do you create your material uh but my material started making fun of like my life you know uh, at the time uh now it comes from like what i see around me you know because i do like going to what open mics i don't know if you know what open open oh, mic definitely, is definitely yeah you know uh and that's where most of my material comes from when i'm sitting there you know there's something about the energy of being like in that area where like you know it's kind of like going to church and like you know you have these Whole, you're in that energy of like oh, holy yeah. energy so when you go to open mic, something you're kind takes of in, over <laughs> yeah you're kind of in that comedic energy so i like to record myself and then i'll listen but when i'm on stage at the open mic i try to just you know talk and that's pretty much how i formulate my joke because then I'll, I'll go back i'll listen to it and I'll, I'll write i'll see what responses i got what what's good and what's not you know most of it is not good um, but you do get some gems. Cause I do that. hear that, um, uh, when comedians write their jokes, it's not just a one day activity. It's, it's a, they might have a joke that they wrote on Monday. They might sit on it for a week or two, come back to it. It's kind of like a process. Uh, is that something yeah. similar that you go through as well? Yeah. It, and some jokes expire, you know, like you, you, you know, you could like, I had a joke about Nancy Pelosi, like, um, <laughs> that expired because it's no longer relevant and it's no longer in the, you know, in the zeitgeist or whatever, you know? So it was funny at the time, but now it's like, it's no longer, you know, relevant. It's gotta, you know? it's gotta so, be, uh, in the moment kind of thing. Especially with political humor, it has to be like, you can't be making Bush jokes. And, and it's the same with, I would say, um, many of the social jokes. So jokes that deal with social issues, right? You're not going to be talking about, you're not going to make a BLM joke now. You could have made it a few years it, ago. Yeah, um, yeah. So no, I totally understand. And so what would you say is like maybe a memorable moment um, out of your years of comedy? One moment that stood out the most to you? Was it maybe meeting one of your favorite comedians or maybe just getting an opportunity to do a massive show that you weren't expecting. What was like a memorable moment? Uh, I would say just being like, cause being selected to perform at the Laugh Factory as one of uh, what they call fresh faces, you know, because in, in order to get there, I would have to camp out, uh, you know, for hours outside the Laugh yeah. Factory just to get like two minutes. And then I did that a few times and after that, I received an email. They're like, hey, we want you to, you know, perform at our fresh, what they call fresh faces. And then they put that video online and it got just reading the comments was kind of surreal because there was so many positive comments and like, you know, it was, it was the first time that I experienced, I would say, uh, online success from my set because, you know, when you perform, you perform it and it's right there in the moment and then it just leaves, you know, but then the Laugh Factory posted my video, full video, posted it online, you know, it's still there. And the overwhelming uh, love that I got from, from the comment section, which the comment section is a very 
very toxic oh, 100%. Uh, environment, <laughs> you know, and it, it always it speaks the truth. So for me to see that that love that I got, you know, when I was still early in my career, that was that was a great feeling, you know, and it, it, it made me more confident in myself, you know. I can imagine. And especially with social media <laughs> comments, uh, you got the trolls, you got the bots, you got the ones yeah. who, who don't like you, but will still watch you. It's, I love the social media comments. <laughs> it is. So Sometimes it's funnier than the post. It actually is. Sometimes you'll have that one comment and they have to pin it, but somehow they don't pin it. But yeah, no, yeah. I totally understand. So what were your, some of your like comedic influences? Like, for example, I grew up in the time of Def Jam comedy, BET comic view. Um, yeah. I'm sure you remember all those uh, very kind of smaller, smaller comedic acts because it wasn't as popular as it is now. Um, yeah. And my top three, I would say, would be like, you know, Dave Chappelle, Cat Williams, um, Bill Burr. Uh, those are some yeah. of my favorites. So what were some of your favorites or influences? You, you know, funny thing that uh, before I started doing comedy, I wasn't really, I didn't really watch stand-up comedy. Oh. Like, I didn't even know it was a, like a thing. You know, I knew of like Chris Rock and like, yeah. you know, I knew Dave Chappelle as a sketch comic. You know, until I went to see my first comedy show, which was at uh, the John Lovitz Theater in City Walk in Los Angeles, which is not there anymore. Th then that's when it oh, like, oh, my God, this is a thing. Like people go on stage and just, you know, make people laugh. That's a thing. You know, yeah. I felt like I was doing that amongst my my little friend group, you know, and that's when I started looking into comedy and like seeing the like, big comedians and like watching their stuff. Of course, uh, Cat Williams was, you know, is still one of my favorites, you know. Nice. Um, there's also this more obscure comic that I like, uh, uh, Rory Scovel. I don't, I don't know if you've ever heard of, of I him. have he's, it, but I'll definitely check him out. Yeah, yeah. He's he's more of a, of a liberal, but I still find his humor funny, you know. <laughs> I still like him, like, a lot, you know, like, I be, because I see my my persona as as kind of like his on stage persona is very similar to mine, you know, except that he's on the other side of the political spectrum, which I totally respect, you know, like uh, we live in a, in a world where we can't respect the other side anymore. Like that's so crazy to me, you know, like you We're could be on the other side. on opposite sides, either you're one extreme or the other. It's yeah, like, there's no common that's ground. So wrong. Like we should be able to sit at the other side and, of the table and have a great conversation about, hey, this is my viewpoint. This is why I agree with this. This isn't this and that. And you should be able to do the same without us hating each other. And that's the beauty of comedy, right? There's no box that comedy can be fit in. Um, everybody has their own style, their own way of doing it. Um, but unfortunately, I'm sure you probably see this too, but comedy is starting to become boxed in. It's you yeah. can't say this, you can't do that. You're offending this, you're offending this person or this mm -hmm. whatever person is but at the end of the day growing up that's why i love comedy i love comedy i always thought of okay maybe i can go on stand up and do something hey, maybe you, you should try it <laughs> maybe i should right who yeah, knows maybe i might fall in love with it um yeah. but the way things are going i see that it's so restrictive and many venues just because of maybe a social media post or maybe because of who you vote for or maybe who you support can limit your opportunities which what do you think of that how is that going on in california or even other parts of the uh, of the states um I, I i think it's an issue because you should allow people to just you know wh whatever side of the, of the spectrum is you should allow them to like express themselves you know like why are we not allowing someone to express themselves just because their viewpoint is different um i do see that in, in los angeles in the la comedy scene a lot where it's like if if you're considered a trumper, then yeah. you're not gonna get spots in in these certain venues. There's open mics where you can't go in and be like you know yourself. You kind of have to be like you know watch what you say and not like not try to offend uh, certain people. Which uh, and uh, I understand because open mics sometimes you know people can walk in and just be like complete a holes because anybody can really sign up and get on stage. But that doesn't define the 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 comedy of like, for example, myself. Who, if you look at my social media, you would be like, "Oh my God, this guy's a extremist," you know. But I'm really not, 
you know. I'm, no, I'm you're actually... definitely not an extremist. You are no. hilarious. Uh, thank you. With good knowledge. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. I promise you, my viewers, if you check out his Instagram, you will see the most funniest Biden, woke, all of those type of hilarious memes. <laughs> and and it's in good taste. It's not in bad taste. It's not like yeah. you're making up or exaggerating. It's you're pretty much just highlighting, hey, this is what's going on. Do we yeah, still yeah. trust this leader or do we still trust this agenda or this programming? When you're comparing California and New York to places like Florida and Texas, what would you say is the major difference other than, of course, you know, the lockdowns, but anything else that you would say is, okay, this is the big divider. Uh, I, I think taxation is, is one of the main issues because your money goes longer when you're in one of those states, you know, like the fact that in California, we get every single tax imaginable, you know, uh, it keeps us, you know, it keeps us poor in a way. And for what, you know, we're paying all this money you know, and you park in San Francisco and your car window gets broken, you know, like you see, then, then not only are you paying taxes, but you're paying for your window to get fixed in California, bad behavior for some reason is rewarded. If you're an honest citizen and you pay your taxes, you know, you're seen as the bad guy, you know? Yeah. That, so, that is something that I kept seeing. Um, what is it? Like if you steal from a store under a thousand dollars, it's okay. Yeah, is that, is that actually not, true or is it just some places? No, it's, it's true in California, which is why, uh, there's a, su a sudden influx of, you know, of people running into stores and like taking a bunch of stuff yeah. <laughs> because that stuff doesn't get prosecuted. And then you, and then you talk to like a, a liberal here and they're like, oh, well, if you look at the statistics, uh, crime has actually dropped, you know, well, yeah, it dropped because you're not counting crime anymore. You know, yeah, you're not prosecuting the crime. So of course the numbers go down. You know, but if you talk to anybody from San Francisco or, or Los Angeles, what we see with our eyes is like there's an increase in in crime in cars getting stolen. There's a freaking car chase almost every day here, you know? Yeah, like don't you guys TV. have a channel that's just on on car chases? <laughs> oh, it's a YouTube channel, but yeah. Oh, it's on your Instagram page. So I know you were telling me earlier before we went live about um, one of your performances that you had at the Laugh Factory the other day. Um, and you actually met Vincent Oshana, who is also very outspoken when it comes to politics, the United States, the elections. Um, shout out to Vincent and everyone at Valuetainment, uh, except for Adam. Yeah. Um, but what are <laughs> your thoughts on the upcoming elections? Um, like, what do you, what does this mean to you? Because I hear it from everybody. This is a make or break election. What is it to you? What does it mean to you? What do you think it means for America? I think um, if if Trump wins, then it's a rejection of the woke left policies that we see in California, that we see like in places like New York, you know, because for me personally, it didn't start as a, I like Trump. It started as a, I really, really dislike the Democrats and what I'm seeing in California, you know, and that slowly evolved into like, Hey, let me listen to, let me, why do, why does the left not want me to look at what this guy's saying? And they villainize him so much, but then I listen to his speeches and I'm like, wait a minute, this guy is not as bad as the picture that they paint, you know, uh, as a Latino, I'm supposed, you know, as a Latino in California, we're supposed to follow this one party just because of my race. I'm supposed to be like a Democrat, you know, I, I reject that. I totally reject that. Like, just because I'm a Latino and I'm supposed to follow this political party, like blindly, like, no, I reject that, you know? Um, I'm and more as of you a, should, and, um, because I'm sure you see it the other side too, where the black community are kind of forced and pushed into voting Democrat as well. And if you don't vote Democrat, it seems like you, as they say, love the slave master. Uh, they consider yeah. the Republicans the slave masters. When actually historically, it was the Republicans that actually pushed for the end of slavery. Uh, for those that don't know, fun fact, but yeah. it's. It is. It's a it's a divide and conquer tactic where they're pushing certain races to vote for certain type of parties, um, with under many lies and propaganda uh, and so on. Because the past week, I've been hearing about something called Project Twenty Twenty Five, where it's it seems like if you vote for Trump, blacks are going to be enslaved again. Somehow, that's the yeah. It, it's some, yeah. 
ridiculous. There's some ridiculous, uh, <laughs> comical stuff in that in that project or whatever. You know that when you when I read it, I was like, what the, like this is so over the top. You know, it is. It's so over the top. It's almost like cartoonish. You know, the fact that this is even mentioned. You know, it's but it, it is propaganda. Like I, I feel like our people are not aware of the propaganda that gets pushed from this political side of the spectrum, you know, because they're so afraid of the other side because the other side has been labeled as like racist, you know? Yeah. But Hey, I feel like the other side wants me to keep more of my money and I'm all on board for that. You know, if I can keep more of my money for my family and my children, then Hey, I don't care you know, like I'm going this side because this side is telling me pretty much I can keep more of my money. One thing that I've realized is the Democrats have always been all about spending. And people ask, where's that money coming from? Of course, it's going to come from taxation, taxing. Right. It's, it's, it's literally, and it's also here where I am, where everywhere you go, you're being taxed on something. Um, it's for this group or for this initiative or this agenda or this project. But then in a few years later, nothing has really been accomplished and where did that money all go? Um, and I know right now with what's going on globally, I mean, at this point, I think Canada and America together probably sent about a trillion dollars in aid, whether it's military finances, whatever it is across the yeah. world. When we have our own people out here living in tents, um, living in not even day to day, they're living week to week because they don't know what to do. So what do you think? Unable about to. Yeah. Like, what do you think about this? Should we continue? helping hey i don't mind helping other countries but just dumping money and not knowing where that money's going or if it's being accounted see, for i think that's the big issue see the the issue like with taxation is that you're sending all this money right as a as a individual we're paying all this money in taxes and the, and whoever is managing that money it's an issue of mismanagement because the money is not being properly managed if if you know, there's this, uh, this idea of like, oh, tax the rich, tax the rich, right? Whatever. Yeah, great idea. But then you tax the rich and where does that money go to? So what's the even the point of taxing if, you, if that money is always going to disappear or end up in the wrong hands? You know, like in California, there was, uh, uh, there was this initiative or whatever where um, they were using $5 million ta of taxpayer money to fund alcohol for the homeless. Wow. You know, so they were paying five five million dollars to fund alcohol for free alcohol for the homeless. Now, in what world is that even a a speck of a good idea? Like, hey, let's that get is tax, wild. Let's get taxpayer money so we could buy alcohol and keep the homeless drunk. You know, like who came up with that I genius idea? You know, priorities, right? Because what they'll say is like, oh, where's your compassion? Where's your compassion? Well, okay, where's your compassion for the woman that has to wake up at 5 a.m. in the morning and use public transportation only to be accosted by a drunk homeless person which got drunk from taxpayer money? You know? Like that my is compassion diabolical, is, diabolical. My compassion is for the lady that's waking up at 5 a.m. in the morning to go to work and has to deal with all these crazy homeless people who are either drunk or you know, on one, that's where my compassion is. The fact that someone can just rob a department store or a liquor store and just not even be arrested is insane. You know, that there is. needs to be society in order for society to function, there needs to be consequences for bad behavior. And we're eliminating the consequences of bad behavior because of, because of what, because of, uh, you know, compassion. Like, that's ridiculous. Where's the compassion for the honest working people? There's, there seems to be no compassion there, you know? It seems like we flipped, uh, we flipped dimensions. It's like the ones that are irresponsible are getting the princess treatment, and the ones that are responsible are kind of just left to do on their own, no support yeah, or barely exactly. any support. Um, and if you ask for support, what are you thinking? There's someone else worse than you. We got to help that person out. Like, yeah. I understand if you're in a horrible financial condition, but if you're stealing from stores, you're 
you know, literally using taxpayer funded alcohol programs, you're at injection sites. I think that needs to be addressed before we start sending billions and billions to something that we don't even know where it's going technically. Yeah, exactly. Because I think, what do you think the number one issue right now is for the elections? Like the number one topic that, um, everybody kind of is on the fence about that will make a difference in their decision. Is it housing uh, or is it just more like taxation or is it more let's, you know, as Trump says, make America great again, let's focus on America or should we continue doing what we're doing? Uh, I, I think the America first issue and also like the immigration issue seems to be like a big, uh, yeah. a, a big thing, you know, like, um, so I think those are the make or break deals. I think even a lot of, a lot of libs, liberals are, are seeing that like, you can't really have an open just a wide open border, you know, that's also not, uh, conclusive with a functioning society, you know? And, and um, you know what, like, just from what we see over here, we, we also kind of look at it weird that your borders are open. It's, and we see videos of people literally just walking across. It's, it's like, a and, and there's like sheriffs and there's police officers and they just kind of say, all right, yep. Just yeah, don't run, just, don't run, just yeah. go in, take your time. <laughs> and look. Look, like my, my parents came to this country, you know, um, also it, not a, with an open border, you know, but you, you like, this is what the left doesn't understand that there's criminal elements that are also coming through the border that are setting up shop here in the United States, you know, and that's not, that's not good for like my family, my kids, you know, these are or organized crimes that, that is also organizing here because it's like completely wide open. You know, like you can't have it wide open. You need to vet people. hundred you know? percent. It's just kind of like going for a job interview, right? You're going to need a vulnerable sector check, a background check just for a simple job. So yeah, yeah. for you to come into a whole country, you know, using their resources, using their medical, their educate, everything that you're using and they don't require a background check. It's, you know, it's I, I don't get it. I don't get it's it. It's insane. Like it's it insane. insane. And it's in the name of compassion. Like. You know, like there's that saying, the the road to hell is paved with good intentions. You yep. know, like you're paving, yeah, your intentions may be good, but you're pretty much paving the a road to hell in, in this country, you know? And it's understandable that <clears throat> people don't want that, you know? Like I, I understand it. <clears throat> and then it, it, it demonizes us, you know, <clears throat> as Latinos or immigrants or whatever, you know? It, it doesn't does. make us look good. No. You know. And another thing that I'm also hearing and seeing is it's not even, um, Latinos that are coming over the border. There's other, it seems like other countries, people from other countries are landing in yeah. Mexico and then kind of uh, making that walk across. A lot of Chinese, a lot of uh, Middle Eastern people, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's crazy. Well, you know what, this season, this election will definitely be a make it or break it because where I am here in uh, Canada, Whatever happens in the States, whoever leads the States, we always, always have, um, some type of connection as well. Um, yeah. if you guys start failing, guess what? We will start failing. So yeah. there are many Canadians here as well, who are fed up with who our current leader is, who are fed up with the leader of the United States as well. Um, and so I hope that, you know, this upcoming election will be not only good for America, but also good for the neighboring countries. You know, you know, I think the anti-Trump marketing that the left has, you know, uh, unleashed on the population of the United States is, has been very effective, you know, because they, they have demonized this guy in a way where people are like, mm, you know, I would rather vote for a piece of trash than this orange guy, you know, but if they take a second and look, you know, yep. at what he's actually saying instead of like the, the snippets that they see on, on social media or whatever people on the view, whatever, oh my gosh. Over. that's exactly what I was going to say when she said, as long as he has a heartbeat, we'll and vote for him. I'm dude, like, she said, serious? she said something even more insane that I'm like, where, <laughs> <laughs> where are the fact checkers in this? Or where's yeah. anybody? <laughs> she said. You know, she told her viewers that if Trump gets elected, he's going to round up all the LGBTQ people and put him in camps. What? That That's so insane. And there's people in the, that actually truly believe that, you know, it's so out of pocket. It's so like it, she's in. 
it, it reminds me of back in the Cold War days where propaganda was at an all time high that you didn't even know what was right, what was real, what was not. Um, I've never been happening. a fan of Whoopi. Um, even uh, during the first round of elections, she was just saying some out of pocket things as well. Um, but this time around, I mean, if you're in that much of a denial that you're going to allow the current leader to continue leading, you know, Whoopi's a millionaire, right? She's a celebrity. I don't even oh, yeah. think she understands the, the, the regular no. person world anymore. So she can vote for whoever, and it's probably not going to affect her life at all, yeah. but she could afford $15 a gallon in gas. It exactly. wouldn't even phase her. When, when Biden got elected, I was like, okay, let's, let's see if they give Biden the same energy that they gave Trump. And it was totally the opposite. Like the salt, they fucking. They didn't even give him any them. energy. They just, no energy. Yeah. <laughs> they let this guy just get away with with anything and just do and say whatever he wants, you know. Which well, is maybe... why I started making fun of him on social media because I felt like, okay, now this guy deserves to be. Clowned. Yeah, clowned, hundred percent. Um. All right, so Kevin, one more question: If you were going to be the president of the United States this term, upcoming term, it's already locked in. You are the president. What will be a few things that you will change or do as soon as you're in office to kind of get America back into shape? Uh, I would eliminate the income tax, you know, because we need more. If, if Americans have more money in their pockets, you know, that will that goes a long way. You know, I think I think uh, the American citizen or the taxpayer needs to be allowed to keep more money in his pocket, you know. Because uh, what, what do they say when they cut taxes? They're like, oh, we're going to have to cut social services. Yeah. I guarantee you that the amount of money that these people generate on a daily basis through like self, sales tax, income tax, property tax is more than enough to fund those programs. You know, it's the mismanagement of those programs. You don't need to send 300 million to Ukraine every, uh, every day on a daily basis, it seems, or whenever exactly. Zelensky asks for. Where's that money coming from? So you have that. So you have that money but you don't have money to fund these social programs. You're just using that against me. Oh, no, no. You know, I'm a good person. I don't want them to cut these social programs. I'm going to continue paying my taxes. You know, that's how they trick you. It's the gaslighting no, they that could, they do. They, they could cut taxes. They could cut your taxes. They could cut the income tax and sales tax and still have enough money to fund these programs. Well, you know what, uh, Kevin? So we are going to wrap it up at this point. Um, it has been an honor, honor talking to you today. Um, Thank but you, we man. will Appreciate definitely, that. yeah, no problem at all. Honestly, I am so happy that I was able to find you on IG and you replied to my DM. Um, we will definitely have more of these conversations and discussions as the elections get closer. Um, because as we both know, it is a make or break election for not only United States, but globally, because Depending on who wins, we can either go right into a new war or maybe not even get into a war. Um, so, my viewers, this will not be the only time that you see Kevin on this channel. I will bring him on with others with differing opinions. And I am hoping to maybe have a few episodes where we have a roundtable discussion, talking elections, politics, society, and whatever else. Because I know many of my viewers are on the fence. I've gotten many questions from you guys asking who am I voting for? What am I doing? So um, instead of me telling you what I think or having one or two people tell you what they think, let's, I'm going to try and get a group of people together. We can talk different opinions. Um, and then from there, you can make up your mind because this is going to be a make or break election year. Um, and so be now that we're kind of off the politics talk, um, before we leave, what advice would you give to an upcoming comedian? Someone that wants to, you know, start in the comedic world, what would be the first, maybe two or three things that they would have to do to start off? Um, I would say you kind of need to like block out all kind of the noise, you know, because at times, uh, you feel like, you know, as a, as a comedian, you're kind of exposing yourself, you know, stand up or on social media, you're kind of vulnerable to other people's, you know, input. So I would say just follow your heart, follow what you feel is, is follow your own humor, you know, and don't listen because everybody's going to tell you, oh, you should do this. You should do that. Just follow your heart, you know, follow your heart, do what you believe is, is funny and right. And, you know, let your heart be the guide. Perfect. That is, that is really good advice. So for all my future comedics, um, you can message me, you can DM Kevin. And if you need any more, if you have any more questions, he, uh, 
either one of us can definitely uh, answer them for you. Uh, so Kevin, where can my viewers find you and shout out any of your upcoming shows or projects? Uh, yeah, I'll be uh, performing at the Comedy Boulevard next week um, on the 18th, July 18th. If you guys want to purchase tickets, you could buy them on my Instagram. Also, my social media is Kevin Bread and Water. Um, so, yeah, you can follow me there, you know, leave a comment. Uh, I'll probably respond to it. So, thank you. Perfect, perfect, perfect. All right, Kevin, on that note, and my awesome people, stay ranting. <laughs> Oh,